This morning's scripture is from Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. Mark 11, 12 through 14. Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. One time I visited a church, and it was, it was beautiful. It was a circle. I've always wanted every church to be a circle since I visited this. And what it was was they had all the pews, and they were in a circle. And then, you know, at the end of the pew, you had a tree. And the reason they had trees was because they had a tree one time, and this little kid grabbed it. Because he had a hand, hand, you know, everybody's holding hands, and then he runs out of hands. So he's got a hand here and a tree here. And so they just put trees at the end. And it was beautiful. And I, I thought, no one could ever decorate anything better than that. And then I read the story they were talking about today. The one where Jesus uses his authority to clean house. I think of that as a, a neat, clean church, real nice. Proper, even. But when we talk about Jesus cleaning up, we got two different stories mixed together. We have the story of a fig tree. Jesus comes to a fig tree, he's hungry, he wants some food. No food. Cursed it. Dead tree. And then when he comes to the temple, you know, ready to worship. Come before God, this house of prayer for all nations. Starts throwing things around. Trash in place. And our natural reaction is, hmm, that's not right. Jesus should be the one coming in making the church look like that. The one who's coming in making this beautiful scene, making it appear everything in order. And the reality is Christ wants something completely different. He'd rather just show what's really there. Instead of showing a beautiful tree that's worthless because it has no fruit, he'd just show you a dead tree. It makes more sense. Instead of showing you this temple that looks beautiful and everything seems to be going neatly, you know, they're buying the pigeons so that they can offer the sacrifices, they're switching out the coins so they don't have pagan coins, they only have the Jewish coins going into the temple, and all this rigmarole, and everything working all neatly together, he comes in and trashes it. So that it can just be a place of prayer. And I think too often we've got this idea of Christ and we hate the first word in this sense so bad that we like to take it away from Christ. We're like, Jesus is loving. That makes me feel good. Jesus gives us hope. That makes me feel good. Jesus gives life. That sounds beautiful. Jesus is authority. Hmm. Obey the authority. <laughs> Not so much a good system. I don't know if you have the same reaction I do, but you're driving down the road, you may or may not be going to the speed limit, and then this person pulls out in front of you with lights on the top of their car. And your first reaction is, oh, jump. <laughs> Nobody gets excited and go, yeah, they're finally back there. I found them. I you seek. No, when we have authority come at us, we have this interaction. We don't like authority. But today's story is one of authority is not evil. Revealing things for what they are is not evil. Because Christ himself reveals to us reality. And reality is not evil. It may not be as good or as pretty or as nice. <laughs> as we want it to be, but it's not even. Today we are in Mark chapter 11, but we're starting in verse 12. 
On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Oh, sorry. You already read that. I'm sorry. We're good. Verse 15. Okay. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who sold pigeons. He would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it. And they were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him. Because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. The thing is, we look at that and we say, and they were all astonished at his teaching. But look what he's teaching. It's not that he's getting up there and saying some things. He really doesn't say very much. He says, is it not written? And then he quotes scripture. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. In the scripture. But you have made it a den of robbers. He, he's really only teaching one sentence. And it's not a matter of him teaching. It's a matter of this authority that they hate. Because what's he do? He comes in there and he flips over the table. The way that you're there preparing for their beautiful service so that once they go into the inner temple, they can have everything ready. They can be all prepared for their nice church. And the outer temple, where everyone else who doesn't get to go into the inner temple, is dealing with the noise of animals, dealing with the noise of money changers, dealing with... All this stuff going on. And they're upset about his teaching because what? He says, my house should be called the house of prayer for all nations. No. Now they might get upset when he calls them robbers. Pretty strong insult. But the reality, he's going in there and just redecorating. But he continues because he tells us the lesson by going back to the fig tree. Verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he said will come to pass, it will be done for you. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. <coughs> we take this out of context, don't we? And it's always this beautiful idea of prayer. Ask for good things. Be thankful. Flowery, flowery, flowery. But in context, that's not really what's going on. He's like, did you see the tree that you cursed? Yeah. Yeah, you can pray like that. You could throw a whole mountain in the ocean if you wanted to. I walk in and I, you know, wither a fig tree. I cleanse the temple. Yeah, but if you really had the faith, you could just trash a whole mountain. Brings a whole new meaning to this when we put it back in the context. Because did you notice he went fig tree, temple, fig tree. And he goes back. Verse 27, he goes right back to the temple and he says, And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But he, but shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. The issue is authority. They're upset by his authority. Whether it's a big tree run, whether it's trashing the temple, whether it's telling his Apostles that they can trash a whole mountain. That question is authority. And we have 
so many concepts because we hate authority. We do so many things because we hate authority. We do it with small children. It's called reverse psychology. Tell them you want something so they'll do the opposite, right? It's the idea that you already hate the authority. So all I want you to do is convince you the authority wants this and you'll do what I want you to do. And that's the, and it works. And we're like, it works with children. It works with all of us. It works with all of us because in us, we want what we want. We want neat. We want tidy. We don't want reality. <coughs> we don't want an authority that tells us, hey, you're wrong. I've been studying this, this concept of interpretation. Right? We do it every day. If you read the Bible, you either interpret or you're a literalist. And I just, can you raise your left hand? Serious, please just try with me for a second. It's okay. It will make sense in a second. Raise your right hand. So I don't have any literalists because I saw two hands. Because <laughs> literally, you should be missing one of them. Literally. Right? Jesus said that. You know, if your right hand's causing you to sin, you don't have one. And most of you have your eyes, except some are shut because you're sleeping. I get that. <laughs> so none of us are taking it literally, so everybody's interpreting Scripture. And the second we have an authority on that subject, we revolt. We rise up. We create another 15 churches. We run away. We do whatever we have to do. We undermine. We do what they do. <laughs> By what authority do you do that? And we ask the same question, and that's the problem with any interpretation is, by what authority? I get up here and I try to stay as literal as possible without sounding just completely chop off your hand and pluck out your eye. And completely, you know, reading the scripture in such a way that you make up crazy things. We are discussing the qualification of elders. And I love the qualification of elders. To watch a conversation on this. Because literally, it says some things that I think most of us think is a little different. You have to have more than one child. If you take it literally, you do have to have more than one child. It does say that children. I don't know why it's plural, no one really knows why, but you then say, is someone a bad parent because they only have one child? Are they a bad person because they only have one child? And you get this unnatural process. And the other one is, what do you do when someone's married, only one spouse, for life, and then the other person, by no fault of their own, dies? Well, I guess they're just a terrible person. They were an elder the other day, but today they're a terrible person. They should have done miraculous healing. It's their fault. <laughs> The fact that Holy Unction was not done and they were not, you know, raised is their fault. They failed. They need to be demoted to trash or something. And th this literal approach sounds really, really good. I love it. It's my favorite. I just, I realize that sometimes I say some crazy things because I try for a literal approach. And I do. Because it comes down to this. By what authority? And as much as I love the Bible, without saying anyone has authority, you know what happens? We just all disagree on it. <coughs> I, I, was, I, I got to meet with my wife's family, and I told you they're beautiful conservatives. And so I played games with them the whole and I'd ask them questions and riddles over and over. And, and, and it was a question of authority. And I was like, well, we don't agree on much. And they're like, of course. You're a literalist. You think you're weird. I was like, okay, fair. I said, but we agree on some things, right? I said, what's something we agree on? 
baptism. I was like, excellent. I said, do you believe that you have to say for the remission of sins after you say the words in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Well, no. I was like, why? Sometimes. Um, I said, do you say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and in Jesus' name? No. Why would you do that? Because they're both in the Bible. And I went at it, and this was the thing I was trying to prove, was that they believe just because you have the Bible, that's enough authority to make you mean. And my little game only had one point. It didn't cause unity. Because without the church, without each other, without leadership, eldership, whatever you want to call them, without them guiding, what you get is a crazy messed up world. Because there's a group of people who I have one of their Bibles. It's pretty similar to ours. I mean, there are some differences. But the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have their own Bible. It's pretty close to ours, though. And I, I read that, and I don't, I don't imagine this group that is so far removed from anything I'm used to, or anything that reminds me of Christianity. Just reading their book, I go, well, that's kind of a weird way to translate that. I mean, possible... But not the way anyone would do it. I wouldn't have taken out that verb. That's a good verb. I wouldn't switch that verb. And I can look at it from a very textual look and go, well, I don't really like the translation, but I can see how it's possible. And I don't imagine the Jehovah's Witnesses. At all. I look at the Bible and I think, hmm, wouldn't it be nice if we all agreed on it? And what I mean by that is my interpretation. It is. I always think that. I say, you know what? I can't believe you're so crazy that you don't agree with me. But we do. All of us do. We expect, we read a passage and we get this image. And you know what we assume? That everyone else agrees with us. But the truth is, you don't. For the longest time, I was convinced that when I got old enough, I was going to cut off my hand. I told you, I went from really literal to eh, pretty literal. I was convinced, but I had to be 18, because you know you have to honor father and mother, so I had to wait till that was out of the way, till I could actually chop off my hand. And then I could be a good Christian. I had some weird views. But guess what I didn't have? I came to the Bible with no teacher. I came to the Bible with no church. I came to the scripture pure and unadulterated and perfect, just reading the word of God and getting out of it when I get out of it. And I'll look back now and go, that was a little weird. Even on my standards, that's a little weird. But how many of us have ever, not even to the extent that the elders help us understand what the scripture means. But, I mean, one of the requirements is that they know the word. And they help us and guide us in the word. And they're apt to teach. And they're able to do these things. I'm not even taking it to that point, which we completely <coughs> rejected. I might as well be upset if we came in and every single one of these pews were bolted down. I want you to notice. <laughs> it's not actually possible. I mean, they're kind of heavy. Um, if all of the pews were standing this way, I mean, it'd be, like, really tall. Imagine come in and every single one of the pews is standing up on its side. <coughs> Instead of having nice decorations, we just take these flowers and find dead flowers and put them all in. Dead bulrush. We just find a bunch of dead things hanging up. Dead possum. Dead rat. <laughs> it's good. This is a country church. <laughs> You know, antlers and everything on the altar. <laughs> and you come into that. And we're like, you know, they shouldn't do that. 
I, I, I I'm serious. I'm not saying that Wayne would come in here and say, I want this to look like the Moose Lodge or something, and you know, moose on every wall. <laughs> I don't know what a moose lodge looks like, I'll admit it. And I'm not saying that Ray's gonna come in here and flip up these guys. They're both in them. But if they did, how much would we balk at that? How much would we say, the church has no authority whatsoever, I do what I want, I interpret how I want, things need to match my way and my way only. They did it to Jesus, we do it to the church today. And Jesus has an answer for us once we realize what the fig tree is. So if I go to a tree and it's got apples on it, it is a apple tree. If I go to a tree and it has oranges on it, it is a Okay, well, I'm good at this. If I come to a Christian and it has the fruit of Christianity, it is a Christian tree. Okay, good. You know trees. If I come to a Christian and they have the fruit of the world, it's not a Christian tree. And Jesus has a very quick answer for that. He comes to the tree, the fruit that is supposed to be on it is not there, his answer follows, then curses the tree. Because if we are Lord, God won't be Lord. The church will never have any authority in our life. None of it will matter. And what we'll do is we'll take the Bible and we'll We'll make sure that the way we view it and change it and sort it is the right way. So that we never have to submit to any type of authority, any teaching that we would challenge, anything like that. And then God will look at us and he'll be so confused when we're calling ourselves a Christian tree and we've got little pictures of ourselves our pride, our own authority, our own idea of us being God. And they look at that tree and what do we expect them to do? Go, I'm going to eat of that fruit. He's going to look at that tree and go, there's not the right fruit on it. It's not there. I came to the tree, I was hungry, I was ready to eat of the fruit. First be the tree. And we, we never want to deal with the fact that Christ has that love and beautiful side where he's our Savior who comes to die for us. But then he goes and sits on the front ready to judge us. He goes and sits on the front ready for the judgment day in which he will say, you know what, you use the word Christian, I get it, it's a cute word, you stole it from Antioch. And he's going to look at our fruit. 
And how ashamed are we going to be to have to say, I believe certain things. Neat. Did it change anything? Did you believe in me so much that you produced the fruit? Did you believe in me so that faith was not dead, being alone, but your faith produced fruit? Because he, he had something very clear in James to say. He said, if you have faith without works, it's dead. Thus dead tree, death fig tree, cursed to its roots. And so we have a negative invitation today. A negative as in motivating in the negative. Because what does our God deserve? And today we have a chance to respond to God as the way He deserves. To just believe what He's asked us to believe. To repent of our sins because He deserves our repentance. To confess Him as Lord because He deserves to be confessed. To be buried with Him in baptism because He has died for us and been glorified so that He is the way, the truth, and the life. So that we then live for Him because He deserves no less. Or if there's anybody who honestly can say they're not producing fruit, their Christianity is not producing any fruit, and they're not ready for Him to judge them. Or if there's anybody who wishes to submit to the elders, we offer these invitations as we stand and as we sing.